Okay. <laughs> I think we're on. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thanks for joining us on this one. So um, this is uh, the I think fourth in the in the series of PD webinars that we've been doing. So if you do want to catch up on some of the other topics that we've been uh, we've talked about in in the past weeks, then you can always go to the um, the A Technology Go To Webinar channel. And you should be able to find them on there. But today, um, welcome. We're going to talk about how to use uh, UHF and how we use UHF to detect partial discharge as a, another complementary technique um, in the way that we do non intrusive testing. Just before we move on, there's a, a little orange arrow uh, in, your, in your control box there. If you click that, you, sh you can find where we've got one handout to hand out to people and also if you want to ask any questions you can type it in the question section so we'll take questions through so the type uh, as soon as a question comes in we'll try and answer so the first part of the presentation i'll be giving um i'm neil davis and uh the second part of the presentation brad will be uh will be giving it so we'll we'll swap over so that we can try and answer questions as we go and try and cover things during the presentation and at the end, there's there's plenty of opportunity uh, to ask you questions, and we'll uh, we'll we'll try and cover everything that we can. So type a question any time that you want. Okay, so let's kick off. Click the right button. Okay, so the the contents what we're going to cover today. So we'll 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 again briefly cover the why we're going to test for PD, uh, the different types of partial discharge that you can get, and the different tech, uh, detection techniques that we use and you can use for non-intrusive detection of partial discharge. We're specifically going to talk, of course, about UHF today. So why do we bother testing for you uh, using the UHF range and testing for PD in that range? Where do we do it? What specific um, use cases are, are there that, that we bring the UHF um, techniques out? And Brad is going to cover a good few case studies to show you how how we, how we use it in, in practice and the uh, the benefits that we get during that. And of course, as we say, questions anytime, and particularly at the end, uh, you'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, to flag up your questions, and, and we will answer as best we can. Okay, so I mean, it all comes back to why do we test, and why we test is is always three particular reasons. Number one is, of course, safety. And when we're talking, we're going to talk quite a bit today about the open terminal type switchyards. So, particularly if you've got oil insulated equipment in open terminal switchyards, you've got the old uh, porcelain type bushings. If they if they fail disruptively, then you can have a significant safety um, impact. You can see in this particular one of these pictures here how much of a disruptive failure that, that will have been. Uh, the porcelain can shatter and it can fly uh, many, many meters away. So you end up with exclusion zones being put around uh, certain particular types of assets if you start getting acid problems in that. So if we can increase safety, then what we're also going to do is prevent failure which of course improves the asset performance. You do both of those things, then you're gonna get a financial benefit. All of three of these things is exactly why we do partial discharge, no matter what technique that we do. If you do it well, you do it correctly, all three of them um, occur. You're not going to, it's not gonna cost you money to implement a program of non-intrusive partial discharge uh, testing. It should be saving you money and increasing your safety. And as we say in the bottom there, Around 85% of um, unexpected uh, substation failures or, or asset failures are associated with partial discharge. So if you're going to use one technique and one technique alone, PD is the one to do for your high voltage assets. So a quick summary of the different types of partial discharge that are out there, because we we will be talking about that through the uh, through the presentation. So the three main classifications of PD is internal discharge, which is stuff that's happening deep inside the body of, of solid insulation. These are the difficult ones. You can't see them. You won't see it during maintenance. Um, that's the one that's going to cause you a disruptive failure with limited warning unless you, you carry out these sorts of measurements. The second one is surface tracking, 
So surface tracking will occur on the outside of solid, uh, the outside of insulation, whatever insulation that may be, um, and that manifests in, in a, a very different way to internal discharge. Internal discharge is a big spark, a big um, burst of electromagnetic activity. Surface discharge is, is smaller sparks and um, tracking across uh, insulation. So they're the two main types of discharge that we really uh, look for to prevent failure. Third type that we've got here is corona discharge. Corona discharge is, is important in this topic because often corona discharge is um, non-destructive. So if we're working on high voltage open terminal switch yards, then you may find that you, you go into the switch yard and you get uh, that buzzing sound, the corona discharge is there, and it's from a sharp point into a gas. So generally there's no other insulation involved, it's a conductor into a gas of some sort. If that happens inside a metal clad switch gear, then it could turn into surface discharge. If it's happening in a uh, open terminal switch yard at high voltage, then likely it's causing no damage. The ozones and nitrous oxides that are, are building up are just going to dissipate away in, in the in the um, in the breeze. And the main thing that you may get in a high voltage switch yard is just rounding of some of the conductors. So that's something that we typically want to ignore when we go into the high voltage switch yards. Now, of course, um, life is never always uh, simple and not everything can be classified quite so clearly. The other one that is important to consider really in, and we will again talk about it in the case studies, is the, it's like an intermediate um, state between surface and internal discharge. So as you can see in, in the, 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 the left hand um, diagram here, it's like a gap type discharge, it's a contact. If we close up the two outside, um, insulation areas, it becomes an internal void, and this displays um, characteristics of surface type discharge in the fact that there's lots and lots of pulses, but characteristics of internal discharge in that you get lots of very high magnitude pulses. So it's high magnitude, uh, high, high discharge rate type of issue. So if you've got a contact problem or a floating metal work problem, then that is the sort of uh, discharge that we pick up there. And that's something that we do use UHF to, to detect uh, quite frequently. So they're the main types of discharge that we talk about, that we concentrate on, and they're the ones that we're going to um, show as we go through the presentation. So a summary of the, the techniques that we, that we use. So um, in the previous presentations, we've shown um, elements of this, but what we have when we're looking for the particularly the internal discharge, then we're looking at electromagnetic techniques and we're using the transient earth voltage temp technique. That primarily occurs in the, in the HF to VHF electromagnetic spectrum, so from two to around 80 megahertz. That's great for detecting the internal discharges um, and it's also very good for detecting high level surface discharges or discharges that have, have got a big component to earth. For surface discharge that's just going across a single um, a single phase of insulation or maybe phase to phase discharge where you get less of a component to earth then ultrasonic becomes our primary technique. If we're looking down cables which is the subject of our last webinar we're looking at the radio frequency or high frequency current transformers to look at discharges that occur down the cables the joints and the accessories down the cables. So that's the radio frequency HFCT often people call it that's usually working down in the um, say 500 kilohertz up um, into the high frequency range. So it's actually working across the medium frequency to high frequency. Where UHF comes in is we're detecting this in a much higher frequency band and where we use this is we use directional antennas. So the, the discharge will transmit the, the, the signals from the PD source and we use a directional antenna working in the operating in the ultra high frequency range up to say around towards the 800 megahertz and that will detect very well internal discharge and also high level surface discharge if you've got um, uh, enough gain in the in, in the instrument to do that it is also very very good and very um, very good at detecting the contact type issues which is again 
like I was saying earlier, is, a, is like a, a high internal discharge, but with a high frequency rate. So UHF, we use in open air acids, particularly where corona is a problem and where TEV cannot be used. And we talk quite a lot about that in the next few slides. So for us, when we, we're looking at the different type of assets, if we're looking at metal clad switchgear, ring main units, circuit breakers, um, panel switchboards, then Tevin ultrasonic is generally the one, the other two techniques that we use. As soon as we go into the open terminal switchyard, then we use three techniques. We add the UHF into the Tev and the ultrasonic. Cable terminations, absolutely Tev ultrasonic. We use the HFCT if we can get on the earth screen. We, use, we can use UHF and Brad is going to show some examples of what we do there. Sometimes it's necessary, sometimes not. It can be a complementary technique. Cable circuits, absolutely. TEV, HFCT, UHF, ultrasonic doesn't typically play a part when you're looking at the cables themselves or the joints only at the terminations. But UHF becomes uh, applicable when we can't get electric, we can't touch the cables, so from a distance. Uh, and then you've got the terminations, power transformers, instrument transformers, which is a big particular issue when you go into the higher voltage switch charts, the CTs, VTs, CVTs. Uh, these are the sort of things that, that can get failure. And UHF becomes a very, very important part of that, as well as capacitors, inductors, reactors. So anything in those high voltage switch charts, we always go into the UHF technique, as well as doing the TEV and the ultrasonic. Okay, so why do we test in the UHF range? One of the big things in this is safety clearances. So we don't have to touch the assets. So we can do things at a distance. So remote measurement using this UHF antenna. So the picture on the right is, um, is a guy using uh, one of our instruments, the PD Hawk. It's a directional antenna operating centered at 80, 800 megahertz. So from that, he's able to find discharge and localized discharge because it's a it's a very much of a directional antenna on these um, open bus bar type components and because we're working at the 800 megahertz we can ignore the corona corona doesn't affect the uhf signals and affect this 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 product here so we'll i'll show you some um uh some slides that show you how why that that works in in a short while and quite important when you're working in high voltage yards so the higher up the voltage um, in particular becomes more important that you don't want to be carrying around big long um bulky metal things so the uh that's <laughs> technical terms that perhaps, um shorter antennas so uhf use shorter antennas so you can use a shorter antenna you can walk around safely so as you can see in here we've got a plastic square box of a very uh, high gain uh, directional antenna that's much more applicable uh, working around the high voltage switch yard than maybe using a yagi antenna for example or something that you work in in the lower frequencies so uhf versus hf stroke um vhf so this is the the spectrum on on the the right hand side so you can see that typically the um we're working uh, when we're looking at TEV, we're working from 2 to 80 megahertz. So we're going right away from the, the top end of the medium frequency all the way through to the, the, the bottom end of the very high frequency. Where we're shifting to go to the UHF, we're going up here. So it's above 300 megahertz up towards 3 gigahertz. Typically, we're working in the, um, in the area just below, around centered about um, 800 megahertz. So the, um, the first gigahertz of, the, of the, the frequency band is where the UHF antennas um, tend to work. Now, the disadvantages on UHF generally compared to HF um, is, is the first one. It, it can also be an advantage at times. So you need to be close to the source to detect it. So the, the, the signals from UHF will attenuate much, much quicker than it does on uh, the VHF. So that's a disadvantage when you're testing in one way, you need a higher gain, it, um, you need to be closer to the discharge. So if we're looking at metal clad switchgear, which we talked about earlier, then um, the, the metal clad acts as a Faraday cage and typically blocks the signals. You're not gonna, you're gonna get so much attenuation that the 
testing using the UHF antenna outside is, is much less effective. So we tend not to use it or not really use it on uh, metal cloud switch gear. Now, some of those disadvantages we can use to our advantage when we're working um, in different areas. So the signal, the fact that the signal attenuates actually allows us to localize. So if we go into an open terminal switcher, for example, um, and we can, uh, we've got a, a high enough and variable gain that we can desensitize the the um, the antenna. We can localize by saying by finding out where we can still see it. So we can desensitize it. It means it disappears, and that means that we have to go closer to the source, and eventually we'll be able to um, localize the the source of the PD. Already said the shorter antenna. Um, UHF good in open terminal switchyards, um, and that less sensitivity can be an advantage in these particular things. The other area that the people use UHF antennas for is when you're actually inside the metal cladding of one description on GIS, maybe um, on the high voltage GIS, or to a certain extent that also can be used on on AIS if you're inside. Um, we're not really going to talk about that. We're looking at non-intrusive. Um, handheld type instruments, but internal sensors is where UHF also plays a part because, again, you're only going to be localized finding stuff inside the switch gear at that point. Now, can, things you have to consider when you're looking at um, UHF is, is the spectrum at UHF can be quite crowded, uh, quite crowded. This is at the bottom here is, is the Australia um, UHF spectrum. The, the, the actual frequency bands for certain things will change from country to country. Um, now, the thing with these areas here, the TV and the, the 3G and the 4G, so 900 megahertz is for, for an example of a frequency band, is the interference sources do tend to be narrowband. So in the top right hand side here, we've got a frequency sweep uh, that we were talking using the PD Hawk from down from 50 megahertz up to a gigahertz. You can see this is just a background frequency um, pattern that you see. And we've got some spikes up here. This will be where the, um, the, the, the GSM, the, the mobile phone sort of things come in. The, the PD Hawk is centered around 800 kilohertz, which um, is in a quiet zone megahertz. in uh, 800 megahertz, sorry, yeah, uh, that's a good point, uh, which is in a, in a quiet zone in Australia. Some um, some other countries may have a, a, a sort of interference at 800, and then you have to detune it or, or tune it up, slightly up or slightly down away from there. Whereas in the bottom here is showing you the frequency sweep from a discharging asset. So this was pointing away from the asset. This bottom one is pointing towards the asset. So again, 50 to um, a gigahertz, you can see how much uh, colored in that, that frequency sweep is. The, the antenna is tuned around 800, so this is why you've got the highest uh, blocking out of the signals around this, but you can see all the way down and across the, the, the wide band. So PD is wide band in its nature. Uh, the interference sources tend to be narrow band, and as long as you can tune away from those interference sources, then you can use that to your advantage and you can still detect the PD. Now, because the signal attenuates quickly away from the source, that's where you get the localization. Bradley will talk and show how we do that in practice. So where do we use UHF? That's how we use UHF or, or why and on the differences and things you need to consider, but where do we actually use it? What's the application? Um, one of the interesting ones, this is not the primary one, so I'll put this up first, is, is on cable systems. So um, across the world, you, you see reports every now and again of, of pavements blowing up, of streets blowing up and, and cables. So underground um, pits, uh, where they've got cable terminations are going. So you can see the guy on the right hand side who was leaving his house has decided very quickly to go back into the house as the pavement is blowing up. We've got a fire coming out of here. Yeah. That's a high voltage cable that's going. The columns, by the way, is nothing to do with the fact that um, uh, the, there was a manhole cover here. It's all to do with the fact that he's stopping people parking outside his house. Um, and here, this is, I think this one is in North America. You can see the pits and the cables in here. 
if we're going to go into the cable pit to do some assessment, and, and I, I remember doing a whole series of testing underground substations in, in Caracas a few, many years ago, where we were going into the pit to test the oil switch gear, which had been blowing up, and also the cable terminations. Then before going in that, testing remotely using um, uh, the UHF antenna, which can, again, tune, um, desensitizing or sensitive enough uh, to be to be picking up discharge from the pit, but not too sensitive that it's picking up all the interference. So tuned correctly at the right frequency, we can assess whether we've got any issues going on inside that pit before we go in. It's another safety check. Maybe some gas checks going on, things like that, but that's a safety check. So that's a, a good application. We don't do that huge amounts. We have done it. Um, but that's a, a great application. Cables generally, um, when they're directly buried, then you've really got the HFCT type techniques, but often you go into certain places, you've got cables on cable trays, you've got joints overhead, joints, cable tunnels we work in, um, underground um, areas where you've got cables over on gantries. ABC, um, we, we've loved it, so where you've got joints in, in um, mid, mid span ABC. Uh, that's where we use it on cable systems as well. So measuring, you can't actually get up there to 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 measure the TEV technique. You're measuring everything remotely using um, HF, uh, using the uh, UHF. It's a complementary technique to the TEV, the ultrasonic and HFCT for cable systems. The other one, the big one that we use and we've talked about more is, is on switchyards and overhead assets. So it will find discharge that's happening inside um, or on the surface of, of assets. Now, the higher up the, uh, the, the, the voltage you go, the higher, the, the more corona you deal with. So we, we, it ignores corona activity, which means it's much easier to do. When we're looking at using we still use TEV, we still use ultrasonic in these applications but when we're using TEV working in the hf vhf range what you find is because the signals don't attenuate as much and you've got a very open system open terminal system rather than metal card system signals travel widely so it can become much more difficult to pinpoint where things are coming from so you might see for example on a circuit breaker 50 db of TEV on a circuit breaker and that 50 db will be in lots of places lots of the stanchions on the cts the vts and things so localization becomes more of a more of a challenge so cross coupling and propagation at hf vhf um, just makes it more challenging it's still doable but it makes it more challenging you go to uhf that cross coupling doesn't happen as much and again you desensitize so that you can localize Then you've got the, the other sorts of assets. So assets behind a cage, for example, so where you can't actually get access to, um, to go and do your TEV testing. So perfectly good uh, example. Another one where you've got safety clearances that you must, mustn't have broke, um, uh, that can't be broached. So sometimes we're able to go and test on, say, um, a, quite an open ring main unit. We're able to test them on the cables. Some other places will, will say that encroaches the safety clearances and you can't then we can use the UHF to do it. So it's a complementary technique. The other thing is that because UHF attenuates very quickly, you can use UHF to confirm that the source is local. So if we find a discharge around a cable termination, um, with a TEV, we, we've got techniques to figure out, is it coming from local to the, the switch, or maybe is it coming from a nearby joint? And we talked about this in the, in the last webinar. But the UHF is another technique where it says, if I can see it at the switch, it's it's at the switch. It's not gonna be 20 meters away up in the, or 25 meters away in a local joint. So it's confirming that the source is local. It's another way, another application that we use it for. Just that word about Corona, why, why does it ignore Corona? Um, typically, Corona activity um, into air decays rapidly once you get above about 250 megahertz. So if we tune our, our instruments around the 800 megahertz, we're way out the range where corona makes uh, a difference. The, the graphs here show you the effects. So 
This is in one of our high voltage test cages, and uh, the picture showed you the corona ha happening uh, as we um, we energize this this just this pipe with a, a spark uh, with a, a spike on the end of it up at 50 kV. The two graphs here are the uh, a reading before we energize the the spike and one after we energize the spike, and that's frequency sweep. The graph on the right hand side is the difference. So you can see there is very little difference once the corona discharge um, source is active, once we get above this 250 megahertz. So basically, corona will have dropped off. The difference between a source with corona and just background is all under the 250 megahertz range. So corona drops off, which means we go into the high voltage switch yard and we're not having to deal with all those sources causing interference um, to us. So that's why um, UHF is, is, is very, very useful at, at when we're working around these 800 megahertz range. Okay, I'll hand over to Brad to go through some case studies, show you how how all of that is put into practice. Okay, no worries, thanks Neil. So I'll take you through a few case studies here. So the case studies, we have used our um, directional antenna, which Neil mentioned before, called the PD Hawk. And there is um, also a newer instrument coming out, which we'll talk about in a sec. So outdoor yard, I've got six case studies to go through, by the way. So case study number one, noisy yard, noisy switch yards and outdoor yards. So quite often you'll, you'll walk into a switch yard, you'll take a TEV test, and there will be a lot of high level uh, amplitude uh, sources kicking off. So you can see here on the right hand side, this was a this is a phase plot taken from a switch yard that has, I think it had about between six or eight different assets. Some of them were poles, some of them were transformers with gas switches. Um, different, two different voltage levels in that yard as well. It was a 33 kV to 11 kV yard. Um, so when you see something like this, you're like, right, we've got a lot going on here, and what can we use to localise where these sources are coming from? So what we're able to do is do TEV testing around the yard, and then pull out the PD Hawk, our directional antenna, and then use directionality to figure out where the sources are coming from. So the particular um, defect that we saw on the previous uh, slide is located here on the top of this power pole and you can see in this yard here. So what I was able to do, this was one of my ones by the way, um, was be able to use the PD Hawk and we got this phase plot where we've got a contact type issue where you can see these pulses of electro uh, of UHF signals occurring 180 degrees apart across a single sine wave along the phase plot. I was able to stand on the outside of this fence, point the Hawk up at this asset here Cap and detect that activity. What I was then able to do was be able to walk into the yard, turn the gain down on my instrument to make it less sensitive and walk closer and closer to the asset and walk around the pole and scan to triangulate where the sources were coming from. So that's one thing you can't do with the TED test. You can, you can detect the signals, but the signals will be traveling everywhere. Whereas the UHF, the PD Hawk will give you a direction to where the sources are coming from. Um, so if I just go back a slide, the actual defect was this 11 kV conductor here was around about one inch from a wooden cross arm and there were sparks jumping across that gap there. So that was the defect. Okay. So case study number two. So Neil mentioned earlier that we can use the UHF technique to test cable elbows and cable high voltage cable terminations. So this one here was a, a set of 33 kV uh, elbow connections going onto the back of a transformer from a ring main unit. So the ring main unit's on the right, these cables just are probably two metres long and they come from the switch into the side of the transformer here. This particular site had a, an issue where they had had a failure at one of these bushings and termination connections here. So they asked us to come out and scan all of their assets for them. What we were able to do was from a, a metre, uh, about a metre or two metres away, was pull out the um, the ultra I mean the uh, the PD Hawk and capture this phase plot. So this phase plot here is telling me that I've got two pulses per cycle. So I've got discharge on both halves of my sine wave occurring when I point the when I point the directional antenna in the direction of these assets here. So it's telling me that very likely I'm picking up the same type of defect. 
Uh, for further confirmation, two other questions. Uh, yeah, there's two questions. I, I'll just swap them now. We've just had a couple of questions coming through. There were there was one or two questions. Okay. One. Yep. So um, we're also able to do a TEV test at this cable here and do a TEV time of flight test, which pointed up towards the termination. So we were able to use three test techniques to, to figure that one out. Um, at certain points in time, you won't be able to have access to uh, to this asset here. You won't be able to get close to it. So one of the only tests that you can do locally at the terminations is the UHF test. So you can stand two metres away and um, run the test with the PD hook. Okay. This is a case study number three. So this is one of Neil's ones. Neil was out uh, testing in quite a rural area out in the poles and wires network of uh, one of the states of Australia. Um, he was about two poles away, two power poles away from this actual gas switch here. He was able to use the PD Hawk and, and test up and down the street. And he found that, right, I've got signals coming from that direction. He was then able to walk to the next pole. There were no signals there. He went to the next pole and he found that he got this, uh, this phase plot here, which is, is typical of um, a little bit of surface activity and also contact type activity as well. Um, 180 degrees apart along the sine wave with the PE hook, and it led him to this gas switch. So then what uh, Neil did was, um, on further investigation, he pulled out a, an ultrasonic uh, parabolic dish and he was able to pinpoint some sound coming from this location here. Then he was able to zoom in with a pair of binoculars and a high powered camera and he found that there was discharge activity occurring where there were two phases too close to each other. So that physically is where this phase here is too close to this phase here. And um, you've got discharge occurring between the two. So Neil was able to pick that up from 100 metres away. And that's where the UHF technique comes into a frame. Okay, case study number four. So this is where we've got surface PD occurring on the inside of, of this asset here. So this is an old piece of, or very old piece of switchgear, um, which has, contains, these are high voltage fuses that you've got your red, white and blue, or red, yellow and blue fuses inside these, these portions of, uh, this portion of the switchgear. And quite often we get surface buildup in there due to, due to clearances and, and um, the environment that it's sitting in. Uh, these particular ones, they, the, the site limits access, no one's allowed to touch them or go near them. So when we open up the doors on the switchboard, we can't go any closer than the barrier of the door. So what we were able to do is stand back and do a, an ultrasonic test and we can hear surface activity occurring in there. But what we're also able to do is stand back and run a UHF test. So we run the UHF test from a distance of a metre or two metres, quite safe quite, uh, in terms of the safety clearances, and we can pick up the same activity. So um, we have a new instrument coming out, which is called the UHF directional antenna. It looks a lot like the old PD hook, but uh, it plugs into the old Z plus two. So I've got one here. So now what we can do is we've got effectively a PD hawk, but it's called the UHF directional antenna. And it plugs into the UltraTev Plus 2. And it is now an accessory to the UltraTev Plus 2. So what we're able to do is utilise the power of the UltraTev Plus 2 to analyse the phase plots, listen to sounds, record the data within the instrument. And you can still use all, all the old functionality that PD Hawk had, where you can do frequency sweep analysis, where it runs from 50 megahertz up to 1,000 megahertz or a gigahertz. Uh, it can also, you can also change your gain settings and you can change your megahertz range that you're, that you're um, uh, testing in. So this here is an output of, of the newer instrument. And what we can see here is the, is the phase plot. We can see that we've got one, two, three, four clusters of activity across the sine wave. And if I just go back a slide, we can see here, we again have got one, two, three, four clusters of activity. So that phase plot there is telling me that I've got two phases worth of PD. If we go forward a slide, this again is telling me I've got two phases worth of PD. Another way that the, uh, the UHF um, 
the gain on the UH. You, another way that we can use the gain settings in the UHF antenna is by increasing it to make it super sensitive or decreasing it to make it less sensitive to cut out noise and all that type of stuff. Here you can see you've got a lot of noise along with the PD, but if I, and that's at a gain of 40, so that's the maximum gain. If I just go forward a slide, this is the exact same measurement in the exact same spot, but at this time we're using a gain of 30. And what you can see is the effect of dropping down your sensitivity. You've gotten rid of a lot of noise, but we can still see the PD here. We can only see PD on single phase here. It's not showing me the second phase of PD, but that, that's just showing you an effect of how it works. Okay, case study number five. This was another one of mine where I was out testing a, a site that had um, quite a number of ring main units, transformers, switchboards, all fairly quite close to each other. Um, I, in this one here, again, I used the UHF antenna. We took the cover off this side of, of the transformer casing. Uh, that's the cover down there. So we've disconnected the cover, taken that off, and we can see where the transformer cables are coming up from the switchboard. The switchboard is in there. Cables come through and they connect onto the side of the transformer here. I ran a UHF test at that spot, and what I can see here is this is telling me that I've got single phase internal void PD when I point the antenna in that direction. So that's telling me that something is going on inside the uh, inside the uh, insulation at that point. So I was also able to run a TEV test at that point. This TEV test here was taken from the outside of the cable where that red arrow is there. And that also is in indicative of um, internal void PD occurring at that, at that area. Um, I was then able to do a bit of more further investigation and I found an out of service tag on the tap changer here and talked to the to the people on site and they um, we ended up coming to a conclusion that it's most likely the tap changer that was discharging because they've had some problems at that point in the past. The also the um on that one there the the pattern that we've got then the number of pulses per cycle and everything else is pointing us towards the discharge being inside the oil. Yep. Yeah so when we get a, a when we get an internal void type discharge and we get a, a very sort of round cloudy uh, type phase plot and your and your pulse count jumps up higher than normal, that is indicative of uh, PD inside oil. Yeah. We've seen that a number of times. Okay. So this is case study number six, our last case study. So this is a an extra high voltage yard, uh, 275 kV, which we, uh, we, we scanned a certain area of the yard because there was a problem where one of the VTs had actually um, failed during service catastrophically and shot porcelain and other bits and pieces around the yard. So what we were able to do is go down and, and from a distance, uh, the, the client was obviously worried about the other VTs in the yard and the other assets in the yard of the same spec. So what we were able to do was test from a distance to see whether we had any, uh, any PD issues occurring. Um, a UHF test with the old PD Hawk we've ran at this asset and we found this activity where we've got a single phase source of surface activity. That phase plot there is indicative of surface activity. Um, and then we were, I was all, I was, we were able to triangulate where that was coming from by walking around the asset, turning the gain of the instrument down until we picked up our highest amplitude signals when we were pointing in a certain direction. And it happened to be when we were pointing in this direction here. We were then able to um, pull out the ultrasonic dish and do an ultrasonic test. Here, we pointed that at this at this location here on the asset. We again it lined up with a, a single phase type discharge issue, and we found that that there was actually a molten metal splash mark from the the failure of the other VT. So we we're able to use two techniques. Yes. You have to be careful. One, one failure can cause another failure eventually. So um, yeah. something that, that we do come across quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. So just a summary. I'll run through the summary here. So the summary. So why do we use the UHF antenna, such as the PD Hawk and the, and the newer directional antenna? So safety clearances is one of the major issues. Where you can't safely get to an asset, and, and physically touch the asset with test instruments 
we can stand back a couple of metres, 10 metres, two metres, one metre, whatever we can do, and run a test from the outside of the asset. Um, the other main, uh, well, one of the other main uh, points of uh, advantages is to be able to localise the direction towards the uh, defect by walking around the asset, testing from different angles because our antenna is directional. Also, we can um, change our gain setting to make our um, antenna more sensitive or less sensitive. When you're in a very, very noisy yard or a noisy uh, environment where you've got a lot of mobile phones broadcasting, and microwave towers and, and, all, and a lot of um, contact noise occurring, what you can do is, is turn the gain down and walk closer to the asset to pinpoint where things are coming from. It will ignore corona, as Neil said earlier, where um, corona or UHF signals from a corona source are quite strong, but they decay rapidly after 250 megahertz. So what we do is measure predominantly around the 800 megahertz range. That's what our antenna is tuned to be most sensitive at, and that's where it performs its best. Um, as always, we use a combination of sensors and test techniques to allow the best localization of whatever we're trying to test, to get the best results, to get the most information about where the defect is, what the defect most likely is, and um, run every test we can to, to come up with a, with a conclusion about, about what's going on. So the more data, the better. Um, the other thing we can do is tune the frequency. So if if we go out there and we want to start testing at 800 megahertz, because that's where everything is, is most is its most uh, sensitive within the antenna. If there's something nearby that's very very noisy at 800 megahertz, but we just change the frequency that we're measuring up to say 810, it's and it's completely silent at that point. That in that instance is the best spot to test for PD, because PD will broadcast over a big range, whereas mobile phones and telephone, uh, our mobile phones and the 3G network, the 4G network, um, uh, radio and television all broadcast in certain very narrow bands. So we use all of that knowledge to our advantage to, to test the best we can. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, we always say with, with the UHF, what it, what it needs to be, you need a very a good range of um, gain, so it needs to be high gain. Uh, because you know, again, that that will allow you to see uh, a discharge source from 200 meters away if it's if it's really quiet in that region, um, which Brad showed. The so a high gain and directionality is very very important. Di a high gain and the ability to then to to desensitize it and to tune the frequency. So they're the they're the things that are very important when we're we're working with the UHF. If you get that right, then it can become a really valuable tool, particularly in these um, open terminals which are and, and situations where you just cannot get onto the cables, for example. Okay. Yeah. That one. And generally, if you do that, I mean, it's the same as we say with with all techniques. Uh, if if you get it right, then you you can increase your reliability, increase the safety. That will improve the performance of the network, and it will lower your costs. The actual um, Buying, buying the equipment, going out there, doing the testing will um, have a, a positive payback in a relatively short period of time if you've got a good number of assets. And the other thing that we, we use it for, of course, is if you've got a, um, a discharging uh, asset that, that's younger than some of the older ones, with, uh, with some of the old assets which are absolutely good condition, then, then why would you replace on an age basis? So this is good information that feeds into the, the whole aspect of, of managing your, your asset population through condition, uh, managing it through condition, through risk, CBRM type approach. So PD is a, a really important tool for all your high voltage assets. And if you get this right, then the payback is relatively quick. Okay. We do have just um, a slight advert at the end. If you want more details on this, which is covering all the, the topics of uh, all the sort of webinars that we've been doing, and you want more one to one training, which is more in depth training, then we are doing these uh, online training sessions as well, uh, where Brad or, or myself, or generally Brad, has is, is been doing it, to be honest with you, um, is, is develop, um, delivering a one day course. So then you, we, we talk through all this in much greater detail, but also 
um, are able to share this this knowledge in, in much more interactive in terms of getting the questions you want, the, the knowledge you're, you're after for managing the, the sort of assets that, that, that you use in, on your networks. So the, there is a registration site on that when the slides and the copy of the presentation is sent out. And the handouts. And the handouts has got. So that handout there, if you uh, download that handout, that will, uh, also refers to the online ah, training session. There you go there. Yep. Okay, at that point, any questions that we have? Happy to take any questions. Or even um, in the chat box, people can write stuff in the chat box as well if they need to. Usually the chat box has a, has a that's where the questions come, usually in the chat box. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Uh, okay, all right. Well, if no one has any questions, you've got our contact details here. So if you do have anything, you do have any questions at any time, please reach out. We're happy. Um, to support everybody in this. We've been doing this a long time. Um, we've got knowledge and we're looking to share. So um, feel free at any time to drop Brad or myself an email. Um, we've got the contact details and we look forward to hearing from you. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you at the next one.